Great, so welcome everybody. So um, let's move on to the next slide. The first thing I want to say is thank you to all of our planners. We actually have quite a big group um, from Berkeley IT, from Citrus and the Benetau Institute, the Division of Computing, Data Science and Society, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Research IT, where I'm from, um, and the Skydeck as well. So this is quite an excellent group and thank you to all of our planners. Um, I want to give a little space and time if there are any announcements that anybody would like to share, feel free to either unmute or if you wanna put them in the chat, I can read them out. I do have a couple of just two little things that might be of interest to folks. One, um, this may be something that many of you know about and I'm just late to the party, but there's a, there's a, a monthly, if you need more Zoom meetings, there's a monthly uh, um, kind of US-wide EDU uh, cloud uh, meeting. Um, it, it seems to describe itself as internet too, which is why I think I didn't look at it at first, but um, I'll, I'll share a link in a minute in the chat. Uh, the meeting this week was, I think of lots of relevance to lots of people doing research in the cloud. Uh, and the other is, uh, I just got word of, uh, Azure has a, a little program where they're giving $5,000 for um, move your research to the cloud. So that's the credits and then some consulting. So I'll put links to that in the chat here in a sec, but some things for folks to share. Thank you, Greg. I'm I have a little bit of a rumor, um, and it, it's not so much a rumor. I have firsthand knowledge is that uh, the security team has acquired a security tool, Prisma Cloud, um, and we are starting to work with a central payer account to sort of push that out and test that. So I hope at some point, once we get a little further down the uh, initial rollout phase to be able to come back and speak a little bit about what it does and some of that. So, but it's really exciting that we, we've got some internal security tools now that's gonna give us some visibility, help us with compliance and a lot of other stuff. So. Excellent. Wow, thank you. And I was thinking the same thing. We would love to have you back and talk a little bit more about that. And I see there's a request, um, if there's a link that you can share it in the chat. Folks are interested. Other announcements? Nice. I see that Bill shared that if anybody would like to join our organizing group, which is actually really fun, um, it's a pretty lightweight, fun thing to work on. Um, you can either reach out to Bill or I, or you know, express your interest in the chat. We'd love to have any other collaborators. Nice, okay, so next thing, uh, we have our usual poll that we would like you to participate in, please. So please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and then it will prompt you to enter a code. When we click on that, don't worry, the code will be at the top of the next screen as well. So that's 53724014. And we first would like to know who's, who's here today? Where are you from? Three, seven, three, four. Lots of IT staff, or you're all really fast on your devices. <laughs> Looks like we've got a great representation from the lab, which is awesome. Some folks from the community, welcome. Guest, welcome. Staff, welcome. Nice. I know we always ask the same question, but it's actually very interesting because it's a different spread each month. I think last month we had a bunch of students here. Um, and I know we have at least one student here and actually shout out to Karina who's helped put together this poll and the slides and is running the slide deck. So thank you, Karina. Nice, okay, nice, thank you. All right, so next question. How much of your work is on-prem versus on the cloud? Which is of course related to our topic today.
And of course, I'll be interested to see how this matches up with what Gary's going to be presenting about as well. So this is fun. So it looks like of more on prem. Oh, 60 40 so far. It's an interesting split. What do you think, Bill? Is that about what you would guess, or are you surprised by these results? Um, well, g given that there's probably some selection bias in who shows up here, uh, <laughs> yep. No, yep. I think it, is, it looks factoring that in, it looks right. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Um, next. Patrick is asking, are exceed resources on the cloud? I would say I would consider those cloud. And I'm looking at Chris Pachorik's little square to see if Chris agrees. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. I'm not sure. Oh, no <laughs> Patrick was asking in the chat if exceed counts as on the cloud, exceed resources. Oh, yeah, I would say so. I say so too, yeah. And I didn't see the option for because everyone else is using it. Um, uh huh. You could use it. It's cool. Oh, so I put cool. That's what I. Put. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. So why do we use the cloud? Why do you use the cloud? Oh, I see. It's scalable. Is another good addition. That's a good call, Ryan. None of the above. <laughs> what? It's not cool. <laughs> well, so this is like interesting to think about, right? You know. Because uh, scalable, I agree, but does that mean it's cheaper to have capacity or things like that? And, and these things kind of really intersect a lot. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. As simple as a question it is, it's like it really has me thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, agree. Oh, this is so awesome. I love this conversation in the chat. So it looks like it's cool and it's fast are the main reasons why one would use the cloud. Oh, yeah, easier. Gosh, this is so great, y'all. Reliable and scalable we have from Steve. Mm -hmm. And it's true, we, sh we should have had it be multiple um, mm. people to pick multiple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Easier to get started. This is great, thank you, everybody. All right, so next, why don't you use the cloud? Allison, harder to catch on fire, no kidding. <laughs> So this is an open response. So let's see here. Cost, security, that's very interesting. Don't know how. Retired, that's such a good reason. Size. Nice, Bill, no downtime. <laughs> so I'm seeing cost a lot coming up here. Slow data movement, yes. Don't trust the third party. I think that's where going back to the exceed question, I know um, I trust exceed a lot more than I do others. <laughs> Potential runaway cost, yep, vendor lock-in, proprietary, clouds have rain. <laughs> Ken, you are cool. <laughs> Only someone was that was cool would say they were not cool. Exactly. You just did the opposite. <laughs> oh, well, we'll have to touch base with UCLA at some point. Mm -hmm seeing the uh, comment there from Brian. Totally. I like this comment, too many differences among the cloud providers. I feel that so much. Need training. OK, nice. Excellent. Well, thank you all. This is OEIS3 MSSEI compliance, vendor lock in. Wow, these are still rolling in. This is amazing. Um, maybe our little planning group can think about what we want to do with this information actually and maybe share it out to the wider community because um, this is kind of a gold mine. Nice, okay, so back to the presentation and on to uh, the main part. Um, actually, before we hand it over to Jeff, I'm gonna turn things over to Bill who I believe has the next slide. Okay, it looks like um, probably 
my slide didn't get put in, but that's okay. Uh, I'll paint the picture for you. It's basically um, uh, a picture of our three pillar model. So we have a three pillar model of infrastructure that we're talking about. And, and really the reason I wanted to inject this slide and say a couple words before we tee up Jeff and Gary is we had a fabulous conversation when Gary showed up to the planning group and we were talking about the uh, talk today. And you know, I wanted to be clear that we're talking about some, some of the challenges with HPC, but we've always said at Berkeley, you know, since I wrote the first cloud strategy back in 2016, we're university hey, first. So upstairs it's with... about finding the right tool for the okay. job. And Ryan, I'm gonna meet you there. Uh, and so it's about finding the right tool for the job. And so one of the interesting things is that we've seen tremendous organic growth in the local data center, in the public cloud where we're spending millions of dollars and it's tripled over the last few years. Um, and also we've seen a 20% growth of on-premises facilities all across the campus. So we're trying to develop this mode in which all three things, all of these modalities kind of can work together. And so um, that was sort of, we had this great conversation. Hopefully we'll recreate some of it here about you know, the purposes and the use cases served by high performance computing versus other things and why you would use different things. And that's sort of always been at the root of this meetup is how and why do you or don't you use the cloud? Because it's not a cloud evangelism meetup. It's it's really to bring us together to talk about that kind of practical um, application of the cloud and to see innovative new things. So with that, um, Jeff, I will turn it over to you to uh, tee things up. I'm really looking forward to Gary's talk. Thanks, Bill. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Jeff D'Ambrosia. I'm, uh, as you can see, I'm one of the science IT consultants uh, at the Berkeley Lab, and my role in this talk today is purely to introduce Gary. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased and excited to be able to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know him, um, I, don't, I suspect most of you do, but uh, Gary is, uh, there we go, thank you. So Gary, as you can see, he's the uh, lead and head of the science computing group at the lab. He also manages the HPC and Savio uh, at Berkeley, um, handles all this stuff. And additionally, he's also my boss, um, a lovely, wonderful person, a great speaker. I'm very excited to get to hear this, talk about his, the study that he worked on. So um, I'd like to present Gary Jung. Go Gary. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and then we'll get started. Let's see here. Okay. And people can see that. Okay. The lead in screen. All yep. right. Well, first of all, I just wanted to um, thank you for the invitation to come to speak to this group. I uh, appreciate the uh, the invitation. I don't speak too often, so I look forward to these opportunities. Um, I wanted to give out a couple of shout outs and acknowledgements to the, my colleagues who helped me. So in particular, Lavanya and uh, Dan Gunter, they are from our uh, uh, data sciences division, which is a new uh, division focused on doing data science. Um, Jay Kraus from our, runs our cybersecurity uh, team at Berkeley Lab. Um, Doug Miller, who runs our computing facilities group, and uh, Feng Chen and Jeff from Science IT who helped me do a lot of the calculations for the cloud cost. So without these people, I couldn't get all the numbers I needed to do the proper cost comparison. So, uh, so thank you to these people. So a little bit of background. For those of you who don't know me, um, you know, I, I, at, at Berkeley Lab, we run a fairly... You, I'd say moderately sized HPC installation for the LBL researchers. So this is separate from NERSC. Some of you may have heard of NERSC. It's a national supercomputing facility, and it's for people all over the nation to use uh, at other DOE facilities, uh, but it's not necessarily just for our researchers. And so um, I run the uh, institutional HPC, which is just for Berkeley Lab researchers and their collaborators. And we have a fairly sizable footprint because we've built this up over the course of 20 years. Uh, right now, the system uh, has about 817 users. We have a couple hundred projects on it. Um, we manage a large institutional system like Savio and then maybe about a dozen 
dedicated clusters for specific research projects. So um, I, I, you know, our, our program has been moving along quite nicely, but the motivation for this talk uh, came about because I'm on a committee to examine the future of research computing at Berkeley Laboratory. So it's a strategic planning um, group that's uh, kind of at the uh, senior management levels. It's been meeting for the past year and we're looking at um, things like, you know, what do we, what is science going to need? What are the investments needed? How big should this program should be? And then, and then because we're looking at where the investments have to go, then we have to look at things like, um, you know, where are we going to, if we do buy equipment, are we going to use a cloud? Is it going to be on on-prem? So all these things come into play. So that is what kicked off this cost comparison, uh, which you're going to see, which was used for the strategic planning committee. Um, you know, just to give you a thumbnail sketch of where we're at, um, you know, we have a 5,000 square foot data center at Berkeley Laboratory. For that 5,000 square foot data center has 850 kilowatts. It was built in 1970. So it's been through a number of, of uh, upgrades over time, seismic upgrades, uh, cooling upgrades, um, you know, so a lot of upgrades over time. Uh, however, because um, uh, we've been growing so fast, um, we're at the capacity of this data center and now large projects are stymied from the beginning. So if somebody came in and said, we needed to put in a petaflop system, we need a couple of rows of racks, um, uh, really there's not a way to accommodate that. We're really down to the last bits of the data center and installing things in a data center are very much like um, those sliding tile puzzles where you move the tile around and you're trying to get things into the right place. That, that's essentially is where we're at. So the goals of the study was to um, look at cloud again. Uh, the, the lab had done a, a study back in 2011. It was called the Magellan uh, Project at the time. We did a very uh, extensive uh, analysis of, oh, there's a little bit of echo, uh, very uh, extensive analysis of, of cloud computing at that time. Uh, but, you know, to rely on something that was from 2011 for uh, strategic planning for today just didn't feel right. So we, the, the purpose of this was to update uh, that uh, study and to uh, confirm uh, our, our plans. So um, as I was saying, so this is kind of a look in, in 2019. We took a look at what our data center um, trajectory was, was and was going to be. So if you look at, um, there's this orange dot here, it says current actual capacity in use. So this was the time of the study. And uh, the capacity of the room was about 850 kilowatts. You could see the red line is the HPC demand and it was above the capacity and that is true. So what you're looking at is that we were had, we were ordering equipment and it was sitting on the floor. And that meant that as we did incremental upgrades to the data center, um, we would have to uh, wait for that to be completed to install the next set of boxes that had been sitting there for maybe a couple of months or longer. Uh, so we were, the data center um, capacity was actually lagging our HPC demand. Um, now, a thing about our, our data center is that, um, you know, we, we knew this coming up. And so we were, had embarked on what you see here called project one was to upgrade um, the capacity of the room to 1.5 megawatts. And so this was actually uh, a very clever re-engineering of our data center to get more capacity out of it. So some of the strategies that we used included moving to 415 volts so we could reuse the same wire infrastructure um, moving to um, direct chip cooling so we can get more out of the water loop in, in the data center. So there's 
actually a whole talk in there about like how you can squeeze the most out of your data center and uh, which 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 may be a good subject for another time. But I'll I'll tell you that uh, essentially over the past four years, uh, we've been uh, over each year we are investing money to bring the data center up to one one and a half megawatts. And that brings us up to like if you look here between 2022 and 2023, you know, our capacity is one and a half megawatts. This is where um, our maximum is for that data center, at which point we will have to do something different. And, you know, one of the things that was on the table is to are we would we do a modular data center or would we go to the cloud and so this is the point of why we did the cloud comparison is we would have to make this decision about whether we would may do that investment in a modular data center so i'm gonna stop for a moment is that i talk rather fast i i realize and so if i there's any questions you know let me let me know Here is the state of cloud at the laboratory. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, I, I will tell you that uh, for enterprise computing, um, pretty much most of our enterprise computing has moved to the cloud. Uh, they use Oracle Cloud. They used to use some of that data center, but it's all been turned over to research computing. Um, so, uh, so I, I think that's a, a pretty easy answer for like enterprise computing. Uh, the cloud is a good solution for that. And that's worked out well for the laboratory. However, um, for scientific computing it's always been a little different because it's a much uh, heavier use of the resources for compute time and storage. And you're not necessarily have periodic workloads at the end of the month when you're doing the general ledger or something like that. I mean, you're really running on these resources all the time. So, uh, so the cost, you know, as most people would suspect, are, are going to be really different than from enterprise computing. But you could take a look here. We actually are big users of, of cloud. We in 2017 we put together, uh, uh, put in place the master pay agreements, and so this allows users. Um, to instead of using their credit card, they can just use their project ID or their chart string, uh, you know, their money at the laboratory, and we can get and they can get onto the onto the cloud without having to, you know, use their own personal credit card to do that. Um, you can look at some of the numbers about how many cloud users and projects we have, adding two to four users and projects every month, and the spending is about 50-50 between the two right now. Um, our annual cloud spend is about 1.2 million and uh, over a 12 month period. So that's looking at a rolling 12 month. It, it was about 1.1, it's about 1.2 now. And, um, you know, interesting facts are like LBL is the largest Google GCP uh, user uh, across the DOE complex. Um, one thing that we've done in the last couple of years, which has helped make this successful is that we have our science IT consulting team and we do more than just provision the cloud accounts. Uh, we will actually help people overcome the barriers to using the cloud. So, I mean, there's a myriad of, of technologies out there and people don't know which ones to choose. They don't know which one's more cost effective. Uh, they don't know what tools are out there. Uh, and so our science IT team has been instrumental in helping some of these people get onto the cloud. And so you can look up here, for example, there's a thumbnail of an article, uh, Autofocus for X-ray Crystallography. And so this is an article about a researcher at our advanced light source beamline who um, was essentially putting his specimens into the beam and doing all the targeting manually. And uh, he thought, well, gee, it would be great if I could do use machine learning to target the specimen so I don't have to do all these manual adjustments for, say, 200 specimens. And uh, so he started to write this on his own. And But then when he came to the science IT team, we said, well, you know, you could use AutoML and we can put that together for you in a snap. And so he does it in the cloud now. It's automated. Great use of some of the tools to get people moving quickly. On, on a cloud. 
Um, you know, cost is a, always a concern. Um, we move to the scientists of the cloud. They say, oh, this is great, all these tools. I have to say it is very, very nice. There's a lot of things that make work. Uh, the word I like to use is frictionless because people can go and grab and find and hook together whatever combination of stuff they need in a cloud. Um, but then they find out how much it costs. And then so then after a while, they'll call us up and they'll ask us to help them move their workloads back on prem. Um, but the cost of overruns are, are a real issue. We had I, I, um, about, I'd say it was about six months ago, um, somebody who was trying to do a demo um, on, on Google and they uh, set something up on a Friday afternoon and left it running. And uh, on Monday morning, uh, we had a, an alarmed uh, set of emails coming to us and calls uh, because the Google team had was checking on it. And this person ran up a $490,000 bill. Um, and it was still rolling up because essentially the billing lags, you know, the computation being done. And uh, so that's a really good example of, of something going uh, where, where there's a, a, a chance of a cost overrun. So that's a big concern. So here's, here's the methodology. There's a, people do a lot of um, cost comparisons. I, people say, oh yeah, I did that, I did that. And then, um, but it's hard to do because there are a lot of unknown costs. A lot of people, are in large institutions like we are, where they don't know the initial investment of the uh, of the building. You know how much they pay for electricity, how much how much work do the maintenance people do? Um, what is the you know what is the cost of the hardware and all the investment going into the data center? Um, so that makes things tough. These hidden and sunk costs make it really difficult to do an, uh, a fair comparison. Um, there's also a lot of performance variables too when you start looking at costs. And you know, I, I name some of these down below, um, like you know, the fact that cloud uses virtual CPUs and we use physical CPUs, or you know, how well it performs depends on the placement group and whether you, you know, if you're doing a parallel job, you know, you want to get everything in the same placement group. Um, Latency is an issue. Um, scaling is an issue. What happens because they don't have InfiniBand on the cloud uh, on the cloud resources, and you, you happen to have the latest InfiniBand interconnect on your local on-prem? You know what happens to tightly coupled jobs in terms of performance. Um, so, uh, so what we did was I wanted to do a, a, as a comparison. Um, I figured what we could try to do is compare the on-prem cost to do the same in the cloud. And the reason why we can do that is um, since we've run our data center for 20 years and we have records of how much we've actually accomplished in terms of workload, you know, I can, we can actually say how many jobs were completed, how many CPU hours were, were, were done over the course of the year um, and, and we can also add in the cost for all, all the on-prem costs. And so what our, our methodology would be to figure out what that is, how much is it that we're, we're using and compare that to the cloud and then actual compute and storage utilized. And I, I wanna make a distinction here because you know, we have a lot of compute nodes. They're not fully utilized. We have a lot of storage, just not fully utilized. So I'm not doing capacity. I'm actually, I'm actually doing a cost comparison of what was delivered to our, our users. And then to go on about the, the assumptions, there, there's a lot of things here that people can talk about in terms of like, is it, oh, that is a hypervisor, the virtual CPU, the scaling, the latency and all this. So for purposes of this, I'm just going to assume that the performance in the cloud is the same as on-prem, even though people may say that that may not be the case. I, I think, you know, if we, if 
you know, we could do this comparison. And then if you say, well, it's 10% faster on prem or something, then you can add your 10% onto the, onto the calculation yourself. So here's a look at the workload. And you can see that we have quite a history of the workload, but this is um, a, a monthly look at the workload. It kind of goes up and down a, a little bit. You, uh, the blue line is the computation. Um, the red line is our GPU workload. And because it, the GPU workload is much smaller in comparison to the computation workload, you see a little inset to the right, which actually shows the ramp up of the GPU usage over time. Um, you see a um, oops. You, you see a kind of a spike in the upper right corner of the graph, and that actually uh, of the on-prem, and that actually uh, represents the usage that jumped up in 2020 um, uh, when everybody. Uh, went to work from home because of the COVID. And so, um, but anyways, uh, this is what we use to develop what our needs were. And it works out to be about 308 million CPU hours a year. And, and this is where the meat of the uh, talk is. And so what we've done is that, um, these cloud providers have calculators. And so I've had help from the science IT team to uh, help me work out some of the costs for um, similar amounts of compute and storage. Um, you see essentially four columns here. You can see the list price. You can see the AWS UCOP contract price. Uh, you can see the GCP list price. And then you could see the new DOE contract price, which is actually uh, a pretty aggressive. It's, uh, uh, my understanding, Jeff can chime in, that we have a better than, than the uh, UCOP pricing for the uh, GCP contract. Um, and then you can see what the costs are for, say, the compute, the GPU, the storage using um, the lowest cost storage, uh, you know, the EBS and then for the luster. Uh, and then here we've essentially just scratched out the um, network egress because a lot of the academic and uh, research higher ed uh, discounts have some proviso for eliminating the network egress charges that you, provided that your uh, compute spend is high enough. The other things that we've added in here, uh, which I've added into the cost, our cloud administration. And so this is for uh, account tool, account creation, config management, um, you know, dealing with the cloud providers, which actually is, turns out to be a lot more work um, than, it, than it might sound like uh, to the casual observer. But um, you know, getting things like credits applied correctly because somebody got some free credits, um, you know, they'll instead of applying it to one research group, they'll apply it to the, like, the whole set of research groups. And then you have to unback that, back that all out. And then you have to have them change their invoicing. And then, so this is, you know, Jeff deals with this all the time. It's, it's actually quite a bit of work. Um, the other thing I'm adding in here is the security. So, you know, we use uh, the cloud um, as it is. We don't have a VPC or any kind of, uh, fancy VPN, which extends LDL net out to the cloud. I mean, we just use the Amazon or the GCP networking. And what we're losing there is uh, on-prem, we, we take advantage of uh, a lot of uh, security, cybersecurity um, uh, measures uh, that protect us. So things like intrusion detection systems, firewalls, monitoring, um, all this thing, stuff that occurs on campus, we do not have in the cloud. So if we were going to set up something substantial in the cloud, you know, I, I don't think if we did something this large that we could be as casual about it, where we would just throw it out there and assume that, you know, that whatever security that Amazon has is good enough, we would have to 
put into place some of the things like the uh, intrusion detection and monitoring that researchers have come to expect uh, that is protecting their research. So the, uh, the other side of this equation here is the on-prem costs. So if you look at um, the first line here, annual PI and hard institutional hardware investment, software licensing, support and maintenance, um, you know, I have records of this over the last several years of purchasing hardware. And uh, this shows you how much we have invested in to, that provides that compute. Uh, I could say it averages on the order of about two and a half million dollars a year. And that is including, um, you know, all this stuff here. So it's quite a lot of stuff. Uh, but we spend a lot on hardware and we do that every year. So I would say that that is a good, in order to maintain or to, to our, our compute, you know, it's at least that. And even at this rate, we're actually, we keep growing it. I have some costs in here for the labor to maintain it. Data center hardware and software costs. The data center labor for the guys who um, rack stuff, deal with the operations of the data center, cable plant. Um, there is a, actually a pretty there. There are a set of people that do that. So I have the cost here, four hundred fifty-six thousand. This is the actual electrical bill. Uh, uh, one thing here, you if, for those of you very uh, that are astute, you'll notice that the cost of electricity is six and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which is a lot lower than what most other institutions pay. And it's because we get our power from the Western Area Power Administration. So we essentially get this power wholesale. But you can see that our annual cost on it is 346,000. And so, you know, if, if somebody else, you know, wanted to say, well, what would it cost at pg e rates? And we'll just change the rates and you can figure out the math. Um, there's uh, our facilities department. We're doing electrical safety, checking HVAC. Um, there's investments in the cooling towers, pumps, the heat exchangers. And so some of this 500,000 a year is some of the incremental um, investment that we were doing to reach one and a half kilowatts. So that would be purchase of a new transformer, new chillers. Um, quite a bit of money in infrastructure here, which I've tried to capture. So now let's take a look at the costs. Hey Gary, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so how are, what's your thinking here in terms of sysadmin and user services support FTEs? I'm not quite sure whether those are thought of as being in both and therefore not in either or? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm taking a simplistic approach to this in that if we were going to, um, uh, it, that cloud is like virtualized hardware. And so that we have people that are managing, you know, on-prem hardware, but if we went to the cloud, then their jobs may change slightly, but you would still need them to do uh, those types of things. Okay. So that, that's yeah. why I, it's a wash and I'm not comparing, okay. putting it in both sides. Is that answer your question? Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yeah. So the, um, uh, so you, people can look and you can see uh, the differences here, but essentially, um, if we look at the most favorable costs with these current discounts set up as the way they are, um, you know, it's about a not quite four to one difference in pricing between using the cloud and on-prem. And uh, you know, I've been trying to be careful about including all the costs I possibly could. I've, um, I've itemized this so that other people looking at this can determine, well, that doesn't apply at our institution. So fine, just take that off your calculation or change a number. Um, but you know, this, this is, base cost here. So let me let me move to a slightly expanded 
Before version. you move on, could I ask one quick question? Yeah. Uh, like the ad, like the last question, the admin sort of portion of that, the cybersecurity for on-prem isn't kind of called out there because it's already been provided and built out, or is that something that's funded some other way on-prem? Um, so right now it's already funded and built out and it provides for the whole laboratory. Yeah, so we have uh, cybersecurity at the DMZ and um, and monitoring across all the lab, not just for scientific computing, but everything. And But we have nothing like that in the cloud. And so if we were going to set up something in the cloud, then cybersecurity, somebody would have to set up something like that for the cloud. In the follow-on question to just the end of that statement, what about the uh, regulations for DOE and some of the other requirements? Are, are you still able to meet them with the native security stack in, in the clouds? Yes, yes. Yeah. I, and it is up to the researcher to confirm that, you know, because every research project is different. So, um, you know, if, if people are working with sensitive data, you know, then, you know, they, 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 make, they will want to do something different. So they have official use only, controlled and classified information, um, export controlled, you know, maybe uh, I'd be more worried about doing checking on on those types of things if, if the research but a lot of our re research is unclassified so that's that's not necessary um yeah thank you yeah i, I will point out though it, it, you know uh that um i believe uh that is a factor that is holding back some of the other doe laboratories because a lot of the other DOE laboratories are not fully unclassified like berkeley laboratory and um and they do have those concerns. Um, so, and uh, as I said earlier, we were the largest GCP user across the DOE complex. And, and I, I think that is a factor. So I'm gonna give you one more, uh, like uh, another look at this. And what I've done here is uh, it's the same slide as it was before, but um, okay, well, what about if we make the investment in a modular data center, what would that look like to our costs? And on the, so I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I was trying to figure out like how to bring the numbers closer together. And so I, what I've added is two more columns on the cloud. One that says GCP DOE and uh, one year where um, these are like the reserved instances. So you can uh, committed use, discount. And so um, if you are, say, uh, do a three-year committed use discount on the, on the nodes or on, the, uh, on, on what you want to buy, then you can drop, get a pretty good discount. So the price can get down to like $11 million uh, for if you're willing to do a commitment for three years. Um, and then on the on-prem side, what I did was I said, okay, um, What's the cost of a modular data center and um, 15 year life? Um, originally they said it was like 4 million, but for this purposes of this, I, I, I put in seven, um, you know, inflation, right? So uh, uh, some of the stuff that goes in here and the facilities that maintain it. And then, so now you can see that on, including the investment in an on-prem data center that the, um, on-prem annual cost comes close to about five million, and uh, but we're still, you know, um, about two x away from, uh, say, using three-year reserved instances. Um, this is a uh, uh, one of the things that we're saying about large projects are stymied from the beginning. So one of the things we're considering is a data facility with about twenty petabytes of data. And so where would we put that you know, if we don't have any room? And so um, here is essentially the, uh, the calculations done for a data facility where it's more storage based. And then you can see that uh, essentially uh, we're looking at a, comparing about 2.9 million a year versus 
5.9 million a year for that. So, um, th so this is kind of my summary so slide. Um, you, you can see here that, uh, you know, I was going to try to do this in a summary uh, round numbers. Um, you know, the standard discounts would be about four times as much. Uh, reserved instances can get it down to three, three X or, um, you know, maybe even two X, I guess if we were, were looking at that. Um, you know, we uh, looked at some other studies. Uh, Fermilab did a study where they tried to um, use the least expensive uh, uh, services they could get on a cloud. So they only ran jobs that were preemptible. They only ran when they could get the uh, pricing only 25% of the spot uh, of the on demand pricing. And um, and they had a specific workload that was amenable to high throughput computing. And they could only get that down to like one and a half times as much as the on-prem. So um, it turns out that uh, after I had uh, started this study uh, that uh, I traded notes with Stanford and they had done a similar study and they also found a similar methodology. They found a three to five X difference in cost. Um, I talked to uh, NASA and they did the study uh, and they said, well, um, it's going to be about four times as much to go to the cloud. And then, um, then they embarked on installing a lot of modular data centers, which turns out to be a lot less expensive to maintain from a facilities perspective. So the fact that they went to modular data centers cut their on-prem costs dramatically. So now they say that now that, they, that they've been doing that, the diff cost difference to them is 10x because now you don't have to deal with aging infrastructures and chillers and all this other stuff. Uh, it's just a lot cheaper to move to a modular data center. So, um, so here is... Uh, uh, I started this um, talk. Uh, let's see here. I'm sorry. Let me move here. Where is this slide? Let me find that slide. Um, where is my slide? Well, I, I I had a slide. Now I don't know what happened to it. Um, but um, it was there for just a minute. Um, so we presented a slide to our uh, associate lab directors and a senior management um, in the last month. Um, and right now, the, uh, they uh, to do uh, on-prem uh, modular data center and to do a general purpose data center uh, for housing um, systems uh, that were required more resiliency. And, um, and these are, uh, I, I believe uh, at the top of the list, uh, we're actually gonna be start planning for the modular data center this coming year, starting October one. And the plan will be to have it in production um, the next following year afterwards. So um, so that's that's my presentation. I'll, I'll stop now and take questions. Thank you, Gary. So there's been a lot of activity going on in the chat actually, and it looks like Jeff and others and Bill have been answering some of the questions. I see um, this one um, from Alec, just for background, how much storage versus compute do you provide? Um, what differences in energy? heat and rack storage or rack space footprint are there between storage and compute? Oh, um, boy, you know, that's, there's a lot of questions in there. So, um, yeah. Uh, so um, maybe just how much storage versus compute do you provide? Right you know. now, um, 
uh, you know, the majority of it is compute and um, uh, the storage that we provide, I think we have um, maybe about five petabytes online right now for, for storage. And um, I wanna say about, uh, and, and this is just a, a rough guess, um, maybe about 60,000 cores uh, that we provide to uh, Berkeley Lab. Uh, hopefully that answers uh, the question. Um, I can, I, uh, people had specific things about like how much power this stuff draws. And I mean, I, I can answer that if, if people, but I'll just need to know what specifically people want to know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, scrolling through and Bill and Anthony, other planners, feel free to jump in. I'm just scrolling through just because it looks like a lot of these questions have been answered. Also feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you or unmute yourself if you'd like to ask Gary a question. I guess Gary, what, how do you get the discount on your power? What, what's that arrangement from? Where are they going um, from? So it, it's something that, um, that the lab has uh, be, because we're such large power users. Um, so it's, it's the we have our own substation, uh, and we get the in uh, WAPA, uh, which is the as I mentioned the uh, Western Area Power Administration, um, is one of four energy providers in the U.S. and they provide wholesale to uh, retail energy uh, energy suppliers and now also federal agencies. But since you know the laboratory is a federal uh, research facility and we're doing we, you know, we use a ton of power for like our accelerators. Um, you know, we, our particle accelerator, I, 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 you know, they, they draw in the millions of dollars uh, for our power. So the, uh, we get this wholesale rate in exchange for uh, if there is a, um, so there is a large demand on the grid or an emergency that we will cut the power. So they, they will let us know and then we'll cut the power in emergency so that this way is available for other use. So the colliders, the, the heavy use of collider energy is really bringing down your compute cost on prem because of that power discount, right? Exactly, exactly. Thank you. And actually I was just about to read your question, Steve, but I see you also have your hand up. So would you like to ask your question? Sure. Hey, Gary. Hey, Steve. So um, I think uh, usually the, when people do these analysis, they're doing the analysis based on forklifting their existing architecture into the cloud. And, you know, it always costs way too much. The counter argument is that if you were to read re-architect everything using cloud native architecture, then the costs may be less. Do you know if anyone's actually tried that or did you try that and it still comes out more? Yeah, no, we didn't. We didn't do that, but it, it, um, I, you know, I didn't want to get too fancy with the uh, calculation, but there, there could be a, a lot of optimizations in the cloud that could bring the cost down. So if you, I, I mean, the fact that, um, you know, th that there are scalable um, instances uh, and you can spin stuff up and down, um, you, you, there, there are ways or even even probably more efficient ways to use the storage a high dollar storage i i think if you figured out a fancy way within the cloud for example to tier the storage you could probably drop the storage cost down um so th there's a number of things other it, just in that in addition to the architecting that could could drop the price but um you know i i i just was trying to go for an apples and apples comparison here yeah, I was gonna say it's the the cost to reallocate everything and make sure it runs correctly is a pretty pretty huge upfront cost for that option. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sure. So I see there's a question from Burke Bundy. Um, what was the final result of the four hundred ninety thousand dollar cost overrun? Did LBL pay the full amount? No, uh, they were pretty understanding about it. Um, so the. Um, Especially, uh, it, um, Jeff was intimately involved, and he could just chime in if I get this detail wrong. Uh, 
but the uh, the person was trying to do a demo and and somehow you know he did, didn't understand um, that uh, you know what he was going to get charged for and so uh, he was using BigQuery which is a very expensive uh, uh, thing and um, and then he was just trying to do something that was uh, that was suggested as a demo by by Google so by explaining the fact that it was a demo, we didn't actually get anything done and it was kind of following their directions. Um, you know, that I think that helped our case. So they forgave the, the $490,000. Um, um, however, um, you know, that, that has also made it so that uh, uh, we're, we're not getting any, uh, uh, they're not giving us any free uh, hours, uh, the way they used to like grant out free hours to our researchers. Mm -hmm. um, that's we're, 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 it's, it's not a bad trade. I mean, you know, $490,000. <laughs> nice. Um, I see it's two o'clock, but I see Chris, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a quick question? We had John Forrest who had <clears throat> put that he was next in the chat. <laughs> ah, thank you for that catch. Sorry about that. John, are you still here? Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm unmuted. I, I retired from UC in 2011. I was running a lot of HPC infrastructure back then. And then I went into the private sector, which uses a slightly different model that might not be applicable to UC, but maybe it is. And that is in, in, in production environments, they'd run production in the cloud where they needed the reliability and everything else. But in lower tiers like QA and staging, they'd run on premises. So it, it was a good compromise because they got the reliability they needed when they needed it, but then they paid less when they didn't need it as much. You know, I'm gonna just say something because I, I, we said it in the beginning, but I, I do want to make it clear that, you know, this is just a cost comparison. And there's a lot of reasons why we use the cloud and, and we continue to grow our use of the cloud. So I, if, I, I'm i not pushing a, oh, let's not use the cloud stance. I'm, I'm really just showing what the costs are. And uh, we, there are a lot of reasons uh, why our cloud use is growing. And uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Chris, um, let's finish with your question. I know some people are going to have to bail because we don't want to get in trouble for for hijacking the uh, seventy now sixty people out of the all staff meeting. But uh, Chris, <laughs> go ahead with your question, and we will. Yeah, I was just going to riff on Patrick's comment, Patrick Smith's comment in the chat, which is you know about. Why do commercial companies use the cloud? And you know, Patrick commented that you know it's easy to to start up for small projects to start up. So I guess my question was, if you if you take an example like Netflix or one of these other big companies that have huge computational demands, I'm just curious if we have a sense of why they're all in the cloud instead of on premise. Is it this? Is it the spiky compute needs, or does anybody, Gary or anybody else, do you have a sense for that? Well, you know, if I may, I'm a former AWS consultant and work with Netflix. And the bottom line is that they computed that it was less expensive to go AWS and, and better result than it was to do their on-prem. However, I think one of the major things with that is uh, that uh, some of these big companies have very um, bursty requirements. And, you know, like uh, the classic was AWS itself. In December, it does more business than it does in two years outside of December. So when you buy compute, you have to have, you have to take care of December. But then after that, you have all this stuff left around that's just sitting there basically. So for something like Netflix, you can give the stuff back and that's a huge cost. It's uh, that you aren't, um, you know, incurring the infrastructure and the, the you know, um, depreciable overhead kind of stuff. Uh, so that, you know, I think there's a lot of factors with that. I, and I think the trick here is there's a lot of soft costs that are really tricky to um, calculate with this thing, like um, how much easier it might be to do some things in cloud. 
Um, the other thing is a consistency. You know, the services in uh, AWS is the example I know, but it kind of encourages the development teams and the production teams to be very consistent in their, you know, operation. And uh, you can do something like uh, uh, green blue environments for for production that are that are absolutely exactly the same but maybe named differently or something like that. So there's a consistency that comes with um, having that kind of resources. But I think the cost for those, all those things are really, um, they're tricky to calculate and they are kind of specific to the business needs, you know, and we're, we're kind of different. We have different needs. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. The beauty oh, of this and, and the one, one other thing I want to say is Netflix and... Um, um, the tax guys, I can't think of their name in a minute, into it, right, are all in with AWS and they're very strong partners. There's a very much a development uh, back and forth with that because each of those companies builds things that then AWS takes in and makes them as services. So their costs are different than we get, you know, although it's been really helpful to play Google off against AWS uh, to get, you know, the prices that we can. Sorry, that's that's what I had to say. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we need to wrap up. Um, this is amazing. Thank you so much, Gary, as you can tell from all these questions and discussion. This is quite, everyone is very interested in this topic and we really appreciate you sharing this work. And thank you everybody for great discussions and questions and we will see you next month. Same time, same place. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you.